Hey, hey, Waffle Gang, I do hope you are well. My name is Mark, and today we're checking out some more relationship stories. And if you do love a Reddit story, why not consider hitting that like, subscribe, maybe that notification bell too. As I always say, it massively helps out. So thank you so much. And let's crack on with today's first story. Now, today's first story comes from All Dem Boats, who says, Would I be the arsehole for contacting my mum's neurologist behind her back about my concerns for her? On mobile, pardon any strange formatting. Here's some info that I figure will be asked about before I get into things. I am listed as someone who can access her medical records in accordance with HIPAA. My dad and her neurologist know each other personally. It's a tight-knit community here. But again, there has never been any issue where they talk about our care without our consent. Now on to the issue. My mum, 59, has multiple sclerosis and depression. She is closely seen by a neurologist for her MS, but doesn't see anyone for a depression other than her PCP, refilling her meds and asking the basic PCP mental health questions. Lately, past year or so, my mum has been having a lot more trouble doing complex tasks and handling sudden changes or sudden semi-chaotic situations. Her moods also seem to change very quickly. She will go from extremely irritable and stressed one minute to happy-go-lucky and a head in the clouds five minutes later. She is becoming slightly more forgetful, but not with anything crucial, just forgetting to wipe down a counter or push in a chair here and there. I have no idea if these issues are MS-related, stress-related, or depression-related, but they are bad enough to worry both me and my dad. We have tried gently and sternly telling her that we are worried about her. She brushes us off every time saying she's just having a bad day. This weekend tipped things for me. I was at work while she and my dad went out to run errands. My dad went to get the car warmed up and before heading outside gave us specific instructions on how to set the alarm so the dog wouldn't trigger it. Set it to stay, not away. My mum repeated the instructions and then did it wrong causing the alarm to go off and causing my dog to panic. She then suddenly didn't know the code to disarm the alarm and was screaming at my dad for not controlling the dog and blamed him for the alarm going off since she did exactly what he said. She didn't. Later that day when I came home, she yelled at me for my dog setting the alarm off. Mid-sentence, her face relaxed and she suddenly was calm and wanted to know about my day. It was uncanny and scary. My dad later pulled me aside to explain what had happened as I wrote above. I told my dad that I think she needs further assessment and he agrees but thinks it would be inappropriate for him to contact her neurologist since they know each other professionally. He said, I am more than welcome to do so, but I am torn. People are worried about her but she is adamant she doesn't need further evaluation. Would I be the asshole if I contacted her neurologist without her knowledge slash consent to explain my concerns to him? And to me, this feels like you're not the asshole in this situation. I mean, you can see what's going on firsthand. You can see what's going on with your mum. And you're just showing your concern, in my opinion. And I'm not sure where this story is located, so I don't know the rules between US, UK, or other places as well. But I remember when my mum was ill and we knew something was going on we knew it was bad and the way she was acting the way she became bed bound etc and still wouldn't give us any information etc and i contacted the doctor a couple of times obviously they couldn't give me information because i'm not entitled to her medical records but out of concern and love for my mum i couldn't help myself so i got in contact with the doctor and whilst they couldn't give me information they could get in contact with my mum and talk to her about what was going on and my mum would play down her situation, whereas I was just saying what I was seeing at that particular time, which gave the doctor another viewpoint to see what was going on, which did give us additional information in the end. But that's neither here or there. What I'm just saying is you're not the arsehole, because I think you're just supplying information about what you're seeing directly, and you're in the best position to do that. So you're not going to be the arsehole from my point of view. And of course, I'm very, very sorry for what you were going through. And we'll start off with Rana Red, who says not the arsehole. You need to keep track of every incident and reach out to the doctor ASAP. Your mum might get upset, but your soul will be at peace knowing you said something. I hope he replies saying thanks. I'm going to buy a cheap journal today to start writing them down. I'm just torn between wanting to force her to get help and wanting her to be independent as long as possible. Since we all know her MS will take that from her someday. 
Lady Kadub says not the arsehole. Family and friends closest to the patient are the best suited to contact any doctor because you're able to see any deterioration firsthand. In on the HIPAA forms or having consent from the patient is not needed because the doctor only needs to listen to your observations and concerns. Since you're on the forms, it makes it even easier because now the doctor can talk about next steps. Raleen says, not the arsehole. My mum is around the same age as yours and has had MS for 30 years. Well, before I was born. She started getting lesions on her frontal lobe about four years ago and her reactions were all over the place. Brain damage presents in so many ways, including impulsiveness and mood swings. She's probably not aware of her own behavior or at least be unaware of how out of the ordinary it is. A neurologist shouldn't give her medical info out without your mum's release, but you can inform them of what's going on. MS patients usually MRIs every one to two years as checkups or as needed. A neurologist may want to get one ordered if they become aware of erratic behavior. And one more from all of me, all of you who says not the arsehole. Listen, I'm so sorry about your mum's illness. That is right, because it could come across wrongly for him to reach out. I know this is really hard, but the sooner you see if she can get help, the better. Timing can make a difference in a lot of cases. Don't hold back. I'm so sorry. The truth is your mum and you are going to start shifting roles. I'm so sorry. It's really, really hard. You have to do what is best for her now instead of vice versa. I'm sorry. Opie then updates the post, which says, again on mobile, sorry for any strange formatting. I began a log of worrisome instances and talked to my dad more about the situation. We both felt we owed her the respect of telling her I'd be letting her neurologist know what was going on. My dad approached the subject after dinner one night and my mum actually took it very well. She agreed that she needed to see someone about what was going on, but she was just scared to admit that things were getting worse. I totally understand her fear and I'm glad she finally let us in and opened up about it. She's going to make an appointment with a neurologist on a day that I'm off work so I can go with her and let him know what was happening. She also agreed to start looking for therapist slash psychiatrist to help her deal with her depression and finding health coping mechanisms for her stress. The conversation also turned to how she's noticing that she isn't capable of multitasking at work and she's terrified. She loves her job and has been with the company over 20 years through multiple buyouts. When she sees a neurologist and gets into therapy, she's going to figure out what additional accommodations would help her be able to succeed best at work. The stress of work or the thought of not being able to work was really getting to her and being able to finally tell us her fears and anxieties while we expressed ours brought us all closer. OP updated again saying many of you requested this update and I have good news. My mum saw a neurologist and he says that what she's experiencing doesn't sound like MS related dementia or worsening. He thinks it's due to very high stress levels that mum is refusing to acknowledge. My dad went with to the appointment since I had to work that day and he laid everything out, so I'm confident her doctor got the real picture. My mum is looking up therapists in our area that specialize in work stress and chronic illness anxiety. I told her that she has two weeks to make an appointment with someone, even if she can't find the one yet. She needs coping strategies and she needs them sooner rather than later. Plus, actually meeting with someone will give her a better idea of what she is actually looking for in a therapist. She can afford to try out a bunch of them, so we aren't worried about that. I'm more worried that she will be too stubborn to actually schedule an appointment. Anyway, things went better than anyone had hoped. Now we just have to wait for her to get to those desperately needed coping strategies. And OP gave one final update, which came a couple of years after the original post, which says, Hi, I'm OP. Here's another update for everyone. My mum is doing really well, all things considered. She still hasn't seen a therapist or psychiatrist, but is taking big steps to manage her stress. She is self-described workaholic and routinely works 50 to 60 hours per week. While she absolutely loves her job and chooses to work this much, it is still stressful and takes a toll on her. The biggest change she has made is taking days off. She and my dad go on many short weekend trips and try to do at least one long trip every six months. These days away from work have helped immensely. Her mood is more positive and far more stable. She is also finding it easier to multitask again now that her stress is under control. I also have since moved out and she doesn't have to worry about the dog setting off the alarm anymore, which probably also helps. On a not so positive note, her MS is still progressing. She got an MRI since the last post and her MS has progressed slightly, resulting in one new lesion in her spine. Because of the location, there is no way this lesion could be causing the symptoms we had all been worried about. 
It could be causing some urinary issues she is being evaluated for, which helps her team figure out the best way to approach them. She was changed to a new medication that they hope will control it better. This will be the fourth MS medication she has been on since her diagnosis in 2004. Being able to break down the barriers to communicating about our concerns for her was such a blessing. She is so much more open about what is going on and we feel so much more comfortable saying, hey, this happened and we are worried about you without her getting upset. I'm glad to hear your mum's doing well and her mood is more positive and she's more stable these days. But I'm also very sorry to hear about it still progressing, of course. But that last line really hit me and I'm sorry to talk about like my experiences. I'd never mean to take over someone else's story or anything like that. But it's just the way it brings back memories for me when I read someone's story. And you talked about breaking down barriers to communicating. And it just brought me back to when my father found out about his mesothelioma. Told he basically had nine months to live. And he was talking about chemotherapy and that might extend things for a couple of months. And he was determined to have it. We were sort of worried about, is it just going to wipe him out for that nine months and he's going to have no quality of life or whatever. I can remember trying to approach that conversation. How do you tell someone when chemo is meant to like extend their life? How do you go up to them and say, are you sure that's what you want? Because you're only going to get two to three months out of it. And it may just knock you off your feet and you may not have quality of life anyway. I mean, we did speak about these things in great detail and it was always painful to do. But the more and more it went on, the more pragmatic I got about it. We knew what was happening, we knew what was coming, we knew the discussions we had to have. Don't get me wrong, it bloody hurt every single time, but we knew we had to have those discussions or things just wouldn't progress in, in the best way they could if you like. You know, he always made the decisions for himself and we absolutely supported that. Whatever he wanted, we were behind him 100%, but we had to make sure all the information he needed was available to him at the time. And like OP said, breaking down those barriers to communicating about hard things like this, it was a blessing like OP said basically. So it's so nice to hear that mum has such a loving family behind her and taking care of her. Absolutely wonderful. But what do you guys make of this story? Let us know your thoughts down in the comments below and let's move on to another one. And our next story comes from Ebb Apprehensive who says, Am I the asshole for telling my daughter that her grades are more important than her pain right now? Preface, if I come off as callous, it's because I'm trying to be succinct. I, 46 female, have a 16-year-old daughter. In July, she was in a car accident. Most of her injuries were mild. She went to the hospital, but they let her go home after a few days of observation. But even after we got home, she still complained a lot about pain. I was concerned and took her to our GP, but they couldn't find anything wrong. I told her it was probably in her head and in response to the traumatic event, and that she'd be fine in a few days. She stopped complaining about it after that and everything seemed good. Fast forward to yesterday and I got an email from her teacher that she's constantly despondent in class and laying her head down and not participating. I was already seeing red from that and I decided to check on her grade. She turned in multiple assignments late and lost points on them, which is not at all on par with her typical performance. I confronted her about it and she was really quiet at first, like she didn't know what to say. I pushed her on it and she started talking about pain again, which I frankly think is bullshit. She hadn't said a peep about it for two months, only when her grades are slipping. We started arguing about it and I said that her grades matter more than her pain. She's a junior this year, it is not the time to be slacking. She's been in her room since, refusing to talk to anyone. She wouldn't even go to school today. I'm at a loss. She's never been so difficult and I'm questioning whether or not I'm in the right here. Am I the asshole? And then OP did edit the post in response to the comments, which we're going to cover in just a second. Now, there was something in the first paragraph that was jumping out to me. The first line, in fact, that you said most of her injuries were mild. And when she went to the hospital, they let her go home after a few days of observation. I mean, I totally don't know about all this, but that sounds more than mild injuries that she might have injured her head or something like that. But needing that observation... And then you said, oh, you took her to the GP, but they couldn't find anything wrong. But GPs aren't the be all and end all. The person that's going through it knows a lot more about what's going on with their body. And then you just played it down, just saying it's probably all in your head. And then she's putting her head down in class and not participating. And she's saying she's in pain. And then you come up with, frankly, you think it's all bullshit. I mean, come on now. 
many people suffer from PTSD after a car accident as well, so that's a possibility too. There's just so much more here that's screaming it needs further evaluation, but Cantor Circle says in quotes, I told her it was probably in her head in, in response to a traumatic event and that she'd be fine in a few days. She stopped complaining about it after that and everything seemed good. I said, so she stopped complaining of pain because you told her to shut up about it. In quotes again, I pushed her on it and she started talking about pain again, which I frankly think is bullshit. She hadn't said a peep about it for two months. And then goes on to say, you assume because she shut up about her pain, because you told her to, that it no longer exists. And you're using her silence on it as proof, while ignoring that you told her to stop talking about it. Yeah, you're the arsehole. Whether this pain is physical or psychological, it's still incredibly real pain. She needs help, not an arsehole parent telling her to shut up and then throwing her silence back in her face. Do better. Crimson Knight says you're the arsehole and a horrible mother. Newsflash, she stayed quiet about her pain for two months because you invalidated her by saying it's all in her head. She no longer felt safe telling her mother that she was in debilitating pain. You did that. And when you found out she had still been in pain for two months, you proved her fear absolutely correct by being angry at her for being in pain. You say that this isn't in line with her past behavior, so logic would dictate that something is wrong. Stop blaming your daughter for being in pain. Sometimes a GP doesn't find the problem. That doesn't mean there isn't one. Do you know what a good mum would do? She would take her daughter to any doctor she could to find out what was causing her child pain. She wouldn't tell her daughter to just suck it up and deal with pain. A good mum tries to help her child, especially when that child is in pain. You failed your daughter two months ago. You're failing her now. Do better. Apologize to her. Help her. Her well-being is way more important than insignificant grades. I mean, really. Would you rather have a living child with a lapse in grades due to a medical issue or a dead daughter with straight A's on a final report card? And I don't think any further comments are needed on that one. I think that one hit it bluntly on the head. So OP came in to edit the post, which says, I get it. I'm an awful person. I wasn't seeing past the grades and I treated my daughter horribly. Thank you especially to the medical professionals who replied. I had no idea this could be so serious. I've already booked a specialist for two weeks from now, earliest appointment, and apologized to my daughter. I know I still have a lot of making up to do. We're going out for ice cream. And our next story comes from one troubled mum who says, am I the arsehole for missing my grandchild's birth to attend my other daughter's wedding? I'm the mother of two wonderful daughters, Sophia 32 and Nicole 26, and I'm really not sure if I was cruel towards Sophia for my decision or not. Nicole got married this year and Sophia had her first child, which is my first grandchild. I've had a good relationship with both of my daughters and I've always tried to make sure neither of them felt like I favored the other. But I admit there were some rough patches with Sophia. When Nicole got engaged, she asked if I'd walk her down the aisle since her father has never been in her life. I asked her what about her uncles or brother and she said no, she wanted me. I was more than happy to agree and helped her plan the wedding. My daughter Sophia announced her pregnancy around the beginning of the year. The timing panned out that she would be due after Nicole's wedding, so asked if I would be in the delivery room with her and stay with her and her husband for a few weeks after the baby was born to help out. I was very excited too, and since we already live in the same town and see each other almost daily, staying with her wouldn't have been a problem at all. Instead, Sophia went into labor almost three weeks early, the afternoon before Nicole's wedding. I missed Sophia's first call because I was already two and a half hours away from where Nicole lives and helping set things up and doing last minute errands to help. When I called her back, I found out she was in labor and she wanted me to get there as soon as possible. I told Sophia I would do the best I could and would let her know immediately when I'd be there. I explained the situation to Nicole who understandably wanted me to be there for her but understood that Sophia wanted me with her too. Nicole was able to move her ceremony to the morning and make it a quick 25-ish minute ceremony. There would be just a few hours gap between the ceremony and reception. I thought this was a good compromise that would let me be there for both of my girls. I called Sophia and she wanted me to get there that night. I asked if her husband was with her and she said yes, so I asked her to please consider him as a second choice until I get there. Sophia got upset and told me to forget about it. I got to the hospital early the next afternoon and missed the birth by a couple of hours. Sophia was so mad she didn't want me to come in when she was moved to her room. I thought that was understandable and would talk to me soon, but it's been a couple of weeks now and I've tried to apologize to her. I've talked to my son-in-law and he said they're both mad that I chose to ditch Sophia when she needed me most for a party. 
So I am here asking an outsider's perspective if I was wrong not to go to the hospital right away. Am I the arsehole? Edit. I did not stay for Nicole's reception. I left immediately following the ceremony. She still had to wait a few hours from the end of her wedding ceremony in the morning until her reception that afternoon. It could not be pushed back later in the day due to the reception venue having an event in the evening. Now, I'm not sure if this one's going to be a bad take on my behalf or not, but the way I'm feeling on this one is OP was in a pretty difficult situation. She didn't know the baby was going to come three weeks earlier than the due date and she was heading to this event and compromises were made to try to accommodate both events, but it just didn't pan out that way and Sophia wanted it her way more than Nicole's. So I think OP was put in a real difficult situation where they tried their best. And I feel that you can read in this post how much she cares about her daughters, how much she wanted to be there to support both of them. So I think there just needs to be understanding from all sides, which I don't think is happening, in my opinion, from Sophia's side at the moment, especially just not talking to her mum after all this went down. There's just one thing that jumped out to me that had me with questions. I don't know what the questions are, but in the second paragraph on this one, you said, I always tried to make sure neither of them felt like I favored the other, but I admit there were some rough patches with Sophia. As I said, I don't know what the questions are on that, and it just had me thinking, is there more information that we're missing here? Obviously, I don't know, so we can only go with the information that we have in the particular story. So I'm going to go with a not the asshole. <laughs> And we're going to start off with New Beginning Shay, who says not the arsehole, and I'm really surprised by the responses here. A wedding is not just a party. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event and almost by definition has parents there to celebrate, unless there's an exceptionally strained relationship. Childbirth is a medical procedure that usually only has one to two support people, and in many families happens two to three or more times. It's nice, but not common or even expected to have grandma there. And it's not like you plan to attend one over the other. The baby came three weeks early. Your other daughter rescheduled her wedding in hopes of you making both work out. How anyone could assume you intended to prioritize one kid over the other or that people weren't accommodating enough considering what was done here just baffles my mind. Karma will get you says not the arsehole and quotes, I've talked to my son-in-law and he said they're both mad that I chose to ditch Sophia when she needed me most for a party. And goes on to say it wasn't a party, it was her sister's wedding where you, her mother, were walking her down the aisle. It sounds like she was wanting your complete attention to the detriment and disappointment of her sister and potential of ruining the wedding. I'm wondering if this has been a pattern between the two and they have often fought for your undivided attention. I could see it being more of an issue if she was having serious life-threatening complications and or if husband couldn't be there but she was not alone but you made a compromise as best to help both of your daughters at important parts of their lives. Graves Digger says no one's an asshole here. You did your best to be at both things, but you're only one person. Nicole was incredibly generous to move her ceremony. Sophia is going through a lot right now. Labor is terrifying and she is a ball of hormones right now. I'd be devastated if my mum wasn't there for my labor and birth after planning on her being, though I probably wouldn't be mad at my mum. Try and cut her a little slack while she's trying to heal from childbirth and adjust to new motherhood. I'm sure it'll all work out. And one more from Ghostvania who says no one's an arsehole here. Two major life events for your daughters overlapped in a way that was out of anyone's control. You tried to be there for both, even getting the ceremony time adjusted to further accommodate, but ultimately one party was going to be disappointed no matter what. I think you did your best in an unwinnable situation, and Sophia will come to understand that in time. And I really do hope that the family comes together again. And the second to last comment talking about being hormones and talking about it being a scary situation. Yeah, it's got to be terrifying. And I still think myself that Opie is not the arsehole, but I think this is just one of those unwinnable situations. And I hope Sophia comes to realize that and not lose family members because of it, basically. But what do you guys make of this situation? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below as always. And just a huge thank you for spending your time with me today. Getting involved in the stories, your love, support and time always means the absolute world. Don't forget at the end of the video, there'll be a couple of playlists there for you, which you can click on and it'll scroll through the videos for you. And it super helps out the channel as well. So thank you so much. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Take care and much love. Wake up, get up, stretch my legs, eat some breakfast. Milk and eggs, brush my teeth up, wash my face, throw my clothes on, start my day. Wake up, 
I can smell the smoke from the bacon. Let's go. See the sun shining from the windows. Okay. I know that today.